Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank and Nigel Turner. Today, Donna and Nigel will discuss data quality best practices. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find the icons for those features at the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides and a recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce the speakers of this monthly series, Donna and Nigel. Donna Burbank is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regu regularly at industry conferences. She has co-authored several books on data management and is a regular contributor to industry publications. Nigel Turner has worked in information management and related areas for over 25 years. This experience has embraced data governance, information strategy, data quality, data governance, master data management, and business intelligence. He is currently principal consultant for the EMEA region at Global Data Strategy, and he is a well-known thought leader in information management and has chaired run tutorials and seminars and presented at many international conferences. He has also designed and run data governance training events for government, universities, and other organizations. Nigel is very active in professional data management organization and has and is elected <laughs> DEMA UK committee member, where he is the joint winner of DEMA International's 2015 Community Award for the work he initiated and led in setting up a mentoring scheme in the UK where experienced professionals coach and support newer data management professionals. He is based in Cardiff, Wales. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna and Nigel to begin their presentation. Hello and welcome, my friends. Hello, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to do these. Um, and as was mentioned, this is a monthly series. Um, data, one of the biggest questions that was already answered, but will come up again. These are recorded. The good news about this, if there's any of these other topics you've seen and missed, um, you can go back to the Dataversity website as well as our own, where we post links to that as well. Uh, also, there's some upcoming events. Um, if you're interested in metadata or enterprise architecture, et cetera, hopefully you can join us if this is your first time with us. Um, if not, welcome back. It's always nice to see a lot of the same familiar names and associated faces uh, that join us each month. So thanks so much for that. So onwards into the content. Um, we're talking about data quality, no surprise. Uh, what what Nigel and I will really hone in, excuse me, hone in on, um, and Nigel and I have been working together, gosh, I think it's over 10 years now. Um, and we've always been a proponent of data quality being really a holistic approach between people, process, and tech. I think the good news is that's a little bit well more well known now than when we started this sort of thing. Um, but it's it's a both and which always makes things a little more complicated when you, you know, it isn't just a tech solution. So what we'd like to do as we do in all of these webinars is to demystify a lot of this. And and great, we can all agree that data quality is important, but what are some really practical day-to-day -day things you can do to improve data quality in your organization and, and why and how that might help. So diving right in. Um, if you've if you've joined us in the past, um, you'll have seen this, which is our sort of data strategy framework, which is trying to get to that point that I just made that that everything is in connect interconnected. So you'll see data quality management highlighted there. Um, but it's hard to do great data quality without a good data governance framework in place. And and if it's not aligned with your business strategy, it's hard to really move things forward. And if you don't have a great data architecture, it's hard to enforce quality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Master data management supports data quality. So um, without trying to overcomplicate things, I think this shows the interconnectedness of something as foundational as data quality. It's not a quick fix. It really is a holistic way of, of doing things and systematic change. So another, um, Favorite framework we like to show, of course, is DEMA or DAMA, depending where you live in the world. Um, and, and of course, you know, Nigel and I have both been involved in the, the DEMA DMBOC and its development and, and testing. Um, 
it, but what we like about it is data governance is, is sort of at the core, which we would, you know, data governance really helps enable all of the rest. But you'll see data quality is, is one of the key, you know, spokes of the wheel. And without reading this whole slide to really what this is meant to show is some of the very specific data quality touch points with everything you do. You can't do great, you know, reporting and business intelligence without quality data, of course, the garbage didn't garbage out. So just, you know, it isn't us that made this up. <laughs> data quality is important and that there are certain best practices around it. So, um, you know, some more facts and figures that, that back up what I think we all know is gut feel. Um, I know I said gut feel in a data call. <laughs> there we go. Um, this is a, a survey that um, and, and Nigel and Dame UK kind of um, helped uh, sponsor, which is, is if you look at a survey of chief data officers, when they look at some of the key critical focus areas, over 90% focused on data quality. And, and one of the quotes there you'll see is that data quality is foundational to the success of any data-driven initiative, which I think probably we're preaching to the converted here a bit, um, but it's really nice to see that management or, or executives are seeing this as well. Um, I think, you know, we'll probably get some nodding heads. I think it's more, what do you do about it, <laughs> right? No one's going to disagree with you. The data quality is important, but I think what we'll try to do in this webinar is, you know, some really practical steps to get there. Another piece of the survey that I, I really um, kind of enjoyed was this one, right? It's, it's what are people who are doing things well? Like we often like to pick on the mistakes, right? But, but what, what does good look like? And then of course, if you're not doing it well, what does that look like as well? So what I like about this one, if you look on the left, those folks that are really treating data as an asset and their data is well managed um, and they have high data quality, when you look at the percentage, they're spending almost 70% of their time getting value from their existing data assets, which is where everybody wants to be. Excellent. Where the folks on the right, when you don't have everything together, you're still spending the same time, there's still a certain amount of hours in a day, um, but you're spending almost 50% of that time fixing the data quality, right? This, a lot of, um, in fact, Nigel has sort of a part-time hobby of collecting data quality statistics because they're everywhere, right? Of, you know, the data scientist that comes in and they spend 90% of their time doing data quality and not the stuff they were hired for, right? So figure after figure, but I particularly like this one because it really speaks to also what good looks like. Once you do, there is light at the end of the tunnel and companies are doing this, right? So once you do get that data right, you can really leverage to start doing the stuff you want to be doing. So um, kind of kind of a, a nice post there. Um Again, really, really what the goal is heading towards this idea of trusted data sets, right? Once I can have trusted data that are foundational, I can make decisions, I can drive data products, I can do the ubiquitous AI that everyone's focusing on, right? But you can't do the cool stuff without the trusted data. And, and, and that, again, takes a village to get there. It's a combination of data architecture, data quality, privacy and security, of course, governance, metadata, and you could probably add to that list, right? But it is a holistic approach. It isn't enough to just get a data set and clean it up and think you're done. It's sort of, you know, the analogy of, the, you know, you, you've cleaned up the pond of water, but there's still dirty streams filling that pond. So if you're, if you're not getting to the root source of it, you're, you're going, to, it's going to be a, you know, a wasted effort because you'll be doing it again and again. And really, and Nigel has a, um, he'll be showing a fairly, um, cohesive uh, framework to really get to that, that what you're building is a continual process that sustains itself and isn't just a bunch of quick fixes that you feel like you keep doing and doing and doing. So um, what is data quality? We're, we're data management professionals. We love ourselves a good definition. Um, and this is one Nigel likes to use as well, which is you know the data that is demonstrably fit for purpose. And, and breaking that down, one is demonstrably, right? Of what was the, the famous quote in the industry? You can't manage what you can't measure, right? How do I know it's of good quality? Do I have specific me metrics and dashboards? Just like we manage our business through BI dashboards, do we have similar dashboards and spotlights onto the data we're using to drive that? So it's, that's a bit meta, I know, um, but it is important to be very specific in what we, what does good look like? And, and, you know, and good, what good looks like really leads to that second point, uh, which is fit for purpose. Data doesn't always, I know we're data people and this is going to sound uh, heretical, but um, it doesn't always have to be 100% correct, right? Certain things should be. I hope my name and, 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 and my you know vendor's database is correct and my address and my salary in the HR database, but not every data element across the org um, needs to be at the same level or what the definition of good looks like, right? And the, the 
what you may use in terms of one usage for data may not apply in the other data, right? So that's where data governance fits in. Does everyone who's using and producing the data have that same view and the same voice, just to be clear of what we're measuring and what good looks like and why, right? So again, just to kind of delve into that a little bit, and this is this is honestly hard for me as a data person because that we we obviously in our own company that Nigel and I work with um, data goal with data strategy we manage our own data and I always have to remind myself it doesn't always have to be perfect everything right um, because I think as data people we can't not see the mistakes right but you do have to filter you have to funnel and you have uh, you have to focus on those high quality critical data elements and then really understand the use cases around those and that's what really makes that holistic approach. Um, and so in, in addressing data quality, you know, I've, I've mentioned the word holistic several times now, and it really is that combination of people, process, and tech. So the people is, of course, it, the governance, stewardship, but, you know, business-centric business rules, and, and Nigel will talk about this as well. You can profile data and you can come back and say, you know, this 80% nulls and, and data types are such and such, but so what, right? And we were working with one client and they had hired an external agency that came back and did a data quality report. And the top thing they mentioned was that, I think this was a couple of years ago, fax number was null 95% of the time, right? And that was their big finding. And I sort of facetiously said, you know, who uses a fax number anymore? Yes, that was null. That was a fact, but it wasn't important. That wasn't a critical data element. And it was 95% null because nobody should be using it. They did not use fax numbers in their business, right? And that might just be a an obvious one, but there's a lot of those types that unless you put the, the business view on it and have business centric rules, nothing wrong with creating it. And Nigel will go through, that is a very good first step to look at the nulls and data types and things, but you really need to get that business value and what are the rules for each group using it. In terms of creating the, the ways to fix the business process, right? That garbage in, garbage out. Somebody is putting the data in somewhere. Um, and I've been accused three times this week of being a glass half full person. So I could have worse insults thrown at me, right? But I maybe have a Pollyanna view of humans, but I'm often not proven wrong when we're in a workshop and we'll say, you know, someone will be entering a data field and someone downstream is using that field. And once, and it said, you know, when, when you don't put that data in, I can't do my job, or you don't have the right valid value for me to do my job. Most people say, oh, didn't know that, let's fix it, right? So I think just understanding how data is both used, consumed, understood across the process goes a huge uh, long. We, we fix a lot of things without even a tool, without even looking at the databases themselves, just getting humans together, talking through how data is used, consumed, created, right? And of course, technology, we are tech people at heart, right? There are tools that can audit. If you are only fixing your data management, data quality by hand, you probably aren't leveraging the best practices, right? There are tools that can automate a lot of the, or even AI nowadays to look at patterns across. There's, you know, social security numbers, you know, that, that shouldn't be, or certain patterns and, and date types and things like that, that can and should be automated, right? And of course, if you don't have a solid data architecture where you even have an inventory or a design of how data flows, again, we've, we've fixed a lot of issues just, you know, don't get me started on my stories. I'll never end the webinar, but you know, we have found, you name it, we were working with one large retail company that had two master data management systems and they were wondering why that didn't work, which if you're not familiar with master data management, that's the single version of the truth. They're like, we like a single version of the truth and so well, we're gonna have two of them, you know? So, but again, if, if no one is looking at that big picture architecture, those types of things can happen. Again, no one's trying to do the wrong thing. Those were two groups trying to do the right thing. They just weren't doing it together. So again, that comes to the people in the, in the full. That's why this is sort of a, a full circle approach, right? You, all of them tying in together as we go. Um, and I think we've hit, hit already the point on the right that data quality is not data cleansing. That's a quick fix. It's a one-time thing that you will keep doing unless you look holistically at this. So probably if, if you're on this webinar or you're familiar with the Damon D. and Bach or any of the best practice, you've heard these dimensions of data quality. If you haven't, I, I do think this is a really helpful way. Again, we in the industry love to argue how many are there and which ones to use, but that's for another day, right? I think these are a fairly standard set and kind of going through some examples. Again, this adds the content. It's not enough. You should always do data profiling. It's not enough to just throw some, you know, SQL statements at some data and see, yep, there's empty or there's, you know, certain data types and things like that. You really need these help add some of the business context. So completeness is the one I just sort of said is good, but not enough. You know, is the data there? 
Is it empty? Is it not empty? Again, maybe it can be empty. Fax number we don't use anymore. That's very fine that that one's blank, right? Consistency, maybe it's right, but it's different in, in every database, right? It could be Jim and one and James and the other, both are names. Let's pick one to use, right? Conformity, does it fit for certain data types? Is it unique? I mean, master data management that I mentioned, there's a whole industry to try to get duplicates out of the system. Is it up to date? I, I, you know, a lot of, if, if you're using open data um, and open data sets, where you could be downloading data from these sites, knowing when it was updated, is it fresh, right? Accuracy, it could be a valid date, but is it an accurate date? How many people, when you're going through these data profiling, you have a lot of people born on January 1st, 1900, right? Because <laughs> that's an easy date to put in. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the, it's conformity to a date, but it's not, it's not accurate or is it reasonable, right? Um, is that is not only not the person's address, but that's not a reasonable range nowadays. You know, there's some people who live a long time, but probably your customers don't have anyone that was born in 19. Right. So uh, just kind of some that's where those business rules come in. And, and that's we do. Do Nigel and I do a lot of data governance. Those are healthy conversations to have. And it's a cycle that Nigel will talk about. It's back. You do some discovery. You set some rules. You know, we, we worked with several uh, schools and, and one of it was the, um, you know, the student has to be 18 years old or younger. And then when they actually looked at the data, there were people older than that. There were parents being involved. There were, so is that the, it may seem like an obvious rule, but it's not until you look at the data, right? And then then there was some healthy discussion. What do we mean by a student? Is, a, is an adult learner still a student or are they something else, right? So again, that kind of speaks to the, the cycle of this and how it isn't just enough to do any one of these. It's a continuous cycle and those rules may change. I mean, there's a top down and a bottom up. Maybe that was a valid rule 10 years ago, but now the business has changed. So what's the governance committee set is not the same as what's in the database right now, right? So we need to kind of sync those up. So what's also always helpful is to kind of go through an example. And I know that in the industry, you know, a lot of us probably in the call love this stuff and can talk all day about this stuff. And you can sound really crazy to your friends, neighbors, and colleagues, because it, isn't that just easy? Isn't that just fixed? So something as simple as, um, you know, the an address, right, of well, how hard is it to get an address? And you're probably all rolling your eyes if you've tried this very hard. Right? And I know, and, and I almost have my hobby of, of uh, Nigel collects data quality statistics. I, I collect, you know, bad customer experiences that are based on data, right? So many of them. And how many times have you changed your address with your credit card and you still get it at the wrong address? Or you have two accounts at your bank and one address is updated and the other one isn't. And you're probably all getting hives just with your own experiences like that. So how hard is it? We know how hard it is if we're doing it in the business, but there's a lot of complexity around something as simple as an address. So firstly, what do we mean by address, right? And we can get academic about it, but oh, is it a physical mailing address or an email address or an IP address? Or, you know, we could just being clear on what we mean by words, words mean things. Um, or is it complete? There, That's an address and, and Billings, what? Billings, Montana, Billings, Massachusetts, right? We don't, we don't know um, until we have all the information. So that's incomplete or conformity, right? That That's a valid address. But in our business rule, we don't accept PO boxes. We only accept an actual physical address, which gets bad to you know the definition of address and the rules around that. So it doesn't conform to your business rule. Again, is it reasonable? You know, I, I often use the dates and, and birth dates and things as reasonable. But here's a good example: nine 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 No Name Street. That that's valid formatting. But is there really a No Name Street? And, and is nine 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 really a valid address? So you know, are there ways we can check for some of these? You know you know, people just kind of fat bringing things in on purpose. So um, linkage and integrity, right? So here it's Billings, Montana, USA, which is a, it is cor correct, but that's not in our country code reference values. We like to use the ISO two character country code of US, right? So again, it may be quote correct, but it's not, it's not link, linked to the integrity of the valid values that we've set, right? Or here's one, it's a valid address, but it is not John's address, right? So those are harder to catch. And that's where governance comes in. How do I, how do I know that that is accurate? It, it can form, a machine can look at this and even validate, you know, on an online database that that is a valid address, but does John Smith still live there? And which John Smith is it? Is it the father or the son, right? We could go all day on this, but that one's harder to catch, right? Or um, if we, again, consistency, and that's where things like master data come in, it's, 
gosh, there's two different addresses now that we both have. That's back to off in your customer service. Is that his old address, his new address? Does he have two addresses, his summer and winter address? We don't know, right? And that's where it takes the village of a system can't always fix that. Some of these are really well-suited to computers, and some of these are really well-suited to people making decisions. And, and the perfect data quality is a kind of a combination across those, right? The other one is timeless, timeliness and currency. That's another hard one to catch. That was his address when he lived, was going to college or university, and he doesn't live there anymore but that is a valid address, right? Or uniqueness, you know, is this the ad is this the same person or are these the right address? Again, we could go all day on this and I've probably bored you already, but I think that shows if you're not living and breathing this every day, the complexity of something as simple as when I get angry at my bank for not having my right address, I'm still angry at them because I know it can be fixed and I will walk you through that. Um, but there is some complexity around it, which is why it takes really a systematic approach. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to talk how we use our approach and, and giving you some of our secret sauce on how to, how to make this work. So over to you, Nigel. Okay, thank you, Donna. And uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to uh, join these uh, these uh, data diversity webinars every summer. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, as Donna said, um, data quality can often be much more complex than people initially think it is. And, and, and if you look online or you look in places like the DMBOC, there are many different approaches and methodologies for tackling data quality. Some of them are very business focused, some much more IT focused. Um, so we, we didn't think any of them really suited the sort of approaches and the principles that Don has been outlining. So we developed our own, just to be contrary. And being consultants, we thought we need to give it some snazzy name, but we wanted to keep it simple. So we said this approach is as simple as A to E. So it's a very much a five-step approach. As Donna said, this isn't a linear thing, it's a circular thing. So that when you're improving data quality, you'll focus in the first cycle, perhaps on making some incremental improvements to the data. Longer term, you might decide you really need something like master data management to really get to the root causes of the problems. So it's a it's a it's a virtuous circle of, of improvement that you're looking to do, unlike data cleansing, as Donna said, which is a one off exercise. You finish it six months later, you've got to start it all over again. And that's a classic cost of failure activity that that earlier survey showed. So our, our five stages are really very simple. And from what Donna said, the first thing you need to do is assess the context in which the data is being used. And that's what we mean by fit for purpose. So, you know, how good does our marketing data need to be? How good does our employee data need to be? And the answers to each of those questions will be different for every data type for every organization. And um, so that's the very first thing you need to do is understand the business context in which the data is being used. Then once you've done that, that will help you to define what fit for purpose should look like based on business needs. But then you've got to baseline your current data sources, which contain that data, to understand what the gap is. So in effect, what you're doing is a gap analysis. So this is what our data needs to look like. What does it actually look like when, when you go through it? We'll, we'll, we'll touch back on that later as well. And then once you've understood the, 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 the one thing, you know, I will guarantee when you do that baselining of data sources, you will find lots and lots and lots and sometimes and lots of data quality problems. So the question then becomes, well, which are the ones we should really focus on? Because you will, you know, you cannot solve all the data quality problems in a single data source in one pass of this methodology. So it's absolutely vitally important, which is our converge stage, to optimize those data quality problems. And if we solve them or ameliorate them, we'll actually improve the business performance of the business most effectively. And then once you've done that and you've focused in on the key areas, you then do, as Donna said, use a holistic approach to develop the improvements. And in our experience, if you've got a data quality problem and you want to solve it, it's really caused by one thing. It's not just people inputting the wrong data or the process is not working properly or the IT not working effectively. It's usually a combination of the three things so that if you're going to develop the improvements, then, then you need to develop those in a holistic way. Then having delivered some improvements to that, the key thing then is to make sure that those improvements are baked in and made permanent so that you don't have to repeat that exercise as in data cleansing again. So that's where the cycle comes in. And, and what I do, I'll talk about each of those in turn. Just a quick comment on the benefits of an approach like this. 
Um, you probably realized already that if we went in, for example, as consultants into an organization, or you were just starting on your data quality journey, you could look at your whole organization by using this method, get a high level view of your key data areas, baseline some of the key data, prioritize it, develop some improvements and evaluate it. So you could do that, but you could also use exactly the same methodology once you've honed in on a specific DQ problem that you're trying to solve, you could still use this approach. You would still want to assess the business use, baseline it, prioritize, develop improvements and evaluate the effectiveness of those. So one of the reasons we like this methodology is that you can use it on all sorts of different levels. So what I'm gonna do now is just briefly walk you through each of the stages in turn and what some of the main activities are, and really just give you a feel for this, obviously, um, because you know the methodology has got a lot more in it than this, but this is basically some of the key principles and practices of it. So how do you assess this business context? Well, the first thing you need to do is understand what your business is all about and understand what it's trying to achieve. And they might, that may sound obvious, but I've spoken to many data quality people when you ask them that question. So tell me, what are the key things that your business is trying to achieve next year? They can't answer it. So if you can't answer that question and you're trying to convince your business to take DQ seriously, you're up against it for, for, for in the first instance. So one of the things that you then do is identify who the key data stakeholders are. In, and I keep talking at the organizational level, or you could be talking at a departmental or a functional level here as well. You know, And you need to talk to people in business and IT. And don't forget as well that I could include external parties, for example, like customers or suppliers. So once you've identified who those data stakeholders are, the best way of extracting the information you need is to talk to them. I know it's very old fashioned, but we're great believers. There's nothing better than a conversation with a sales manager or, an, or a HR director to understand what some of the key issues are with the data that they deal with. And then, you know, you ask them questions like, you know, where is this data stored and processed? Um, I always ask people what's working well. Um, and that is something that's important because it then gives you gives you some evidence of well-managed data uh, that you can then aspire uh, or then you can then repeat those processes maybe elsewhere. And then you ask them what needs to be improved. And in our experience, 15 minutes later, if you're lucky, you've got a list of 20 things that would, that, that, that person would like to be improved. And you also ask them as well, of course, the important thing that Donna said, what are the benefits of better data quality? It's all we want to say, do you want better data quality? Yes. But unless you answer the question why and so what, then there is no point in doing it. Don't even start to improve data quality unless you've got a very clear idea of what the business benefit, the business value of what you're going to do is going to be. Um, so that's really critical. I mean, on the right hand side, you'll see there, and I'm not going to go through all of these. Some of the outputs of this stage, you should have by the end of this stage, a good idea of what the business critical data areas are. Some cases, it may be down to an object or even an attribute. The, the, some of the high level impacts of some of the problems, you should know who the main data creators and consumers are. If there's any accountability or governance of the data, you've got a feel for that because they're going to be key people to improve its quality. Should have a list of current problems. And that's what we mean by a governance prioritization log and use cases so that you've actually got some real hard evidence of what the issues are. And then what are the lost opportunities of the or the opportunities that could be achieved should we correct the data? And some of the outputs we've listed there, and again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, these will vary depending on the type of data you're looking at, but things like we find, for example, a racy stakeholder matrix is good to capture your stakeholders. Um, I've mentioned already, you know, the need for a, for a single log of the problems that you find. We find as well, using something like a business data model is very helpful to understand the main data types and the main data domains, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also very keen on business process models, because as Donna said earlier, then really there's nothing like the use of a data in a business process and understanding that to really begin to understand what the priority data elements are that have the biggest impact on whether that process works properly or not. And then at the end of that, you should have some sort of case for action, very much at a high level, because every individual data quality problem will have a different business case. But you've certainly got there some evidence that action needs to be taken. So that would be the first step, is the assess step. Then you move on to step two, which is what we call baselining. Um, and, and basically what, you know, um, Sorry, Donna, could you move it on to slide two? 
sorry, yes, there we go, baseline it, thank you. Um, and this is where Donna mentioned earlier the importance of data profiling. So you can do this in many, many different ways. There are many data profiling tools available, ranging from very simple, free, open source tools through to very expensive, very sophisticated um, data profiling tools, many of which contain AI, ML capabilities these days, and you get what you pay for, uh, as in life. And the reason that data profiling is a vitally important thing to do is that basically um, you can then go through one or more data sources. The better data profilers will look at different sources together and compare the values, for example. But even the basic data profilers will give you something like you see here. You can even do this on an Excel spreadsheet uh, if you really wanted to. So if you take your city, for example, um, you know, you see that field called city has a minimum length of three, a maximum length of 20, and a minimum and a maximum value. And even by looking at that, you can then begin to see, well, why is Aberdeen all in capitals? Why is Waterloo all in lowercase? So that might indicate mm, there is a lack of consistency by the way that we capture city name, for instance. And, you know, you can go through and that actually the, the advantage of doing it this way is, as Donna mentioned, and I'll touch on that in a minute. You can then check the conformance of this data set against what the business thinks should be the rules for that data. And a rule would be when we capture city name. Do we do, you know, even at the simplest level, is it in capitals or lowercase or a combination of the two? That would be an example of a business rule that you can then begin to think about and derive from just looking at the data. The other great thing about this, and this is where I find the greatest value of doing this exercise, is then in a workshop environment, say where you put the business people and some of the IT people together, you can actually show them the outputs of this profiling exercise and say, is that right? Um, you know, do you spot anything there that you think is causing you an issue or a problem? And sometimes you will uncover problems people aren't even aware of yet. And that can be very helpful as well. So they're a really excellent starting point for what you do. So how do you tackle data profiling? Well, the how-to bit is really on the next slide, I think. And identification of the scope is something that you've already done in the assess stage, in effect, because you've asked people about what the key sources of data are, where the tables are, um, and some of the other things you see there. And then, you know, the first thing then is do some basic column profiling. So that means each each attribute, each field, um, look, you know, look at that. And the, a, a profiling tool will do this for you, or you can write SQL or Excel to do it for you. You know, how many rows are there? Um, is the column nullable? Do you have entries in that column, for example, that are nil or nulls? And should there be nils or nulls? Maximum and minimum values I've already talked about. And, and various other things there. Then this is where Donna's dimensions of data quality comes in, because you can then assess those, those columns as well against those criteria like completeness and conformity. So for example, if you have a country code attribute, um, is that attribute shown in different formats using different standards, for example? So that would then indicate there's an issue with the conformity rule on this data. So you can actually start to, start to go in. And then finally, um, the importance then of summarizing the findings of all that in order to then start to think about, well, what are the priority things we need to look at? Um, you know, do we need to improve, as Daryl said earlier, the definitions of some of these fields? Because people clearly don't understand what they should represent and the data that they should contain. Um, so then once you've done that, you can then you're then beginning to narrow down. You start with a wide funnel of all the problems you found and then start to narrow it down a funnel so that you get to the point where you can then have an informed debate um, with business, with the business and IT talking to each other. I know that's quite rare in some companies um, actually reviewing those findings with both the business and IT. Because sometimes the business will say, well, that's that that problem, that data quality issue isn't a problem for us. But then IT might say, well, it is a big problem for us because it constantly causes our runs to fail, for example. So that's why having both perspectives is really good. And um, who should be doing this? Well, if you're in an organization where you're fortunate enough to have some sort of formal data governance, the best people to lead this sort of activity are going to be the data stewards and possibly as well with the involvement, depending on the level that you're working at, uh, some of the data owners in the organization. If you don't have data stewards or data owners, then basically create a team of people who have a real interest in this 
and work together as a, as a, as a, as a, as a working group in order to look at potential solutions to fix the problems that you found. And then you conduct these working sessions. And then basically, as Donna said earlier, you know, you can then start to think about which of these problems that we've uncovered are really the most important things to try and tackle first. And that's where this the, the importance of convergence is, is critical. One thing I would say, because as I said, it's a funnel, you'll have a lot more data quality problems at the beginning of the convergence stage than you will at the end of it for the first pass, because you've deliberately de decided to focus your time, resources and attention on a smaller subset of the problems. But that doesn't mean to say you throw all the others away, because remember, as I said earlier, A to E is a cyclical process. So you might then pick up some of the less prioritized issues or the more difficult issues, perhaps in some cases, in your second pass through the methodology and the approach. So this is why it's continuous. You won't solve the problems with one pass. You will improve the problems in one pass, hopefully, but then there will be other improvements that you can make as well once you've done that. So that's the convergence phase. Then you basically, um, as part of that as well, Donna mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, a term that's increasingly being used now is this concept of a CDE or a critical data element. And um, certainly I, I work with companies where they've put their whole data quality focus through governance on those what they call CDEs or critical data elements. And you see a definition of it there, which I won't go through, but you know, there's usually quite easy to get agreement. If you take this record on the right, which is an employee record, for example, um, which of those fields are the most important ones to be correct? Um, not all data is equally important. So the important thing is, is to focus and prioritize on the data that has the biggest impact if you get it right. And this means that if you have a data steward leading a working group, for example, they can then focus on the CDEs rather than trying to fix all the problems in every field of data. And this is also critically important because as we'll see, they're one of the you can't manage what you can't measure, as Donna said, and therefore um, you need to decide which employee attributes you want to report on in your evaluation phase. You don't want to report them all, so maybe you just report on the CDEs, and that's a very effective way then of starting to build dashboards. And as I said, how do you identify a CDE? We've mentioned a lot of it. It's importance to the business, or it could be, for example, if it's personal information, PII then clearly that needs to be right because you're breaking data protection rules if you hold in accurate data on an individual, um, for example, and that could be a legal requirement for your industry or business. So then you do that. So then you develop having this then, then narrowed it down <coughs> to critical data elements. You can then develop an, uh, uh, the improvements and implement the improvements. And we haven't got much time to talk about that other than to say, you know, you need to think about what your KPIs would be. You need to think about what process changes might we want to make or need to make? What technology changes or, or enhancements would we need to put in place? And what new training or new, new data literacy programs or, or, or projects we might need to put in place uh, in order to improve, for example, the quality of data entry? And every single data quality issue that you'll address will have a different combination of those things. I've seen data quality problems that are 90% solved simply by retraining data entry clocks. But then I've also seen data quality problems that involve quite complex interactions between people, process, technology, and the data itself. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is create, um, as you see on the right there, a foundational DQ dashboard. And this is an example of a real one that we developed for a, for a client. You'll see there that basically that dashboard says, you know, um, those are the dimension scores underneath. They didn't use them all. These were the ones that were most important for them. And you can then you can then build processes to produce new, uh, fresh data, refresh that dashboard once a week or once a month. And then that can be discussed in data governance forums, for example, if you have such a thing, or discussed by your working group to demonstrate, as Donna said earlier, that you are making improvements. So where do these things called uh, business rules come into all this? Donna mentioned these already. Um, and I want to re-emphasize the importance of these things. Sometimes people get a bit confused about the difference between a business rule and a data quality rule. Um, my take on this is that all data quality rules are business rules. So as you know, that one I used example of city name, 
is it a business rule that, that a city name should start with a capital letter and be in lowercase? That is a conformity business rule, for example. And that is also a data quality rule. But there are also business rules that aren't data quality rules. So an example would be, you know, I'm an employee in organization A. Uh, my contract of employment says that I cannot do any part-time work for any other company. That is a business rule, but it's not a data quality rule. So data quality rules are subsets, uh, is a subset of, uh, in my opinion, a subset of, of, of uh, business rules. Um, these are the, you know, but in the context of data quality, then business rules define the standards that the data must conform to. We've talked about that. So where do you discover or derive business rules from? I've already mentioned some examples of that. So I won't, I, I, I'll just move on quickly and talk about um, deploying business with some approaches. So how, once you've identified what the business rules should be, how do you then enforce and apply those rules back into your source systems and your applications? Well, one of the things I mentioned already, you simply improve the training or improve the guidelines for people doing data entry. You might provide them, for example, with a business glossary that they can access to say, what does that attribute mean? What does that field mean? And what's valid data to put in that? So you can do a lot by, by simply improving the training and data literacy of the people that are managing and dealing with the data. The second thing you can do much more you know, longer term uh, high level activity is to start to look at MDM, for example. So if you know that your customer data is a problem and that you have various versions of it in different applications and systems across the organization, then making the case maybe for a customer MDM hub would be a very strong thing to do. But obviously that's a much longer term and a more expensive thing to do. And you can, of course, uh, discover and enforce business rules within application code. So if, for example, you know, you have a drop down menu for a data entry screen, then you can make sure that the code only allows preset entries that are consistent with the business rules that you've defined. And then also you can use more and more sophisticated data quality tools to do this. For example, a data quality business rules engine, where basically all the key business data quality rules are held in one platform. And that one platform then enforces those rules across all the source systems that use those particular fields and those definitions. So there are very many, many different ways to do it, many ways to skin a cat when it comes to data quality. And then the final stage, which is critically important, and once you've defined the improvements, it's vital then to monitor that the data is, con is continuing to comply with the business rules that you've created for it. Um, you know, and therefore, it, continuing to evaluate the data is very important. Because the other thing, of course, is that businesses change every day, data changes every day, new problems pop up every day. So having a constant and continuous monitoring process is vital because if you don't, then something will bite you in the backside in six months time that you're not aware of today. So you're trying, what you're trying to do here is be much more proactive about identifying potential data quality problems. And you can see there as well that, you know, we would always say, the one way to make sure you sustain the gains is to have a formal data governance process in place where data owners and data stewards own the rules and are also responsible for the data quality of the data that they produce uh, for their data consumers. And you know, the other thing is, as Donna mentioned as well, is remember, don't just don't just measure the data quality. That's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. The important thing is to try and relate your KPIs and your dashboard to business benefits. So if you can say, if we re if we increase the accuracy of our marketing database from 60% to 70% next in, within a year, that means we will sell more things and we will gain more revenue. So if you can express some of those KPIs in revenue terms rather than just in DQ terms, then the business will sit up and take notice. And it's also demonstrating the value of what you're doing. And you know what are the outputs and tools of this? You can have these things called data improvement plans that could be for a data domain, for example, or it might be for um, for a specific one off project that you're trying to do and then establish those gains more permanently. And the other key thing about all this as well is communication planning. So how do you how do you do that? I think I've covered most of this already. So, you know, you, they can be used to, inf the important thing about de developing the rules is you can check that existing data continues to adhere to those rules. But of course, most importantly, that if you built those rules into your data entry processes, you can be sure as well that new data coming in 
doesn't then start to break those rules as well. So it's a way of cleaning your current data, but at the same time preventing bad data getting into your, into your applications. You monitor this by DQ dashboards. And then, as I said earlier, relate all these things to the business outcomes. The only last thing I was going to mention here in this bit is we Donna mentioned earlier, I think, about AI and about the relationship between AI and data quality. And we all know, as I said, Donna said earlier, that AI is critically dependent on having good data quality. Um, Donna, can I have the next slide just to just to talk through this very quickly? Thank you. Um, so the potential synergy of but um, so we all know that that AI depends on data quality, but increasingly I'm uh, beginning to find as well now how many tools manufacturers are recognizing this that AI can actually help to improve data quality. So it's a self-sustaining synergy uh, of the two disciplines, if you like, of data management coming together. And I won't run through this because of time. But you can see here, you know, AI can increasingly be used to, for example, automate data capture. Uh, it can also automate data cleansing if you give it the rules. But be very wary of that because um, tools can still get it very wrong, as we know can happen with AI disasters. It can predict potentially future problems. Um, it can look, for example, at historical data to see where problems tend to arise, what circumstances they arise. It can, for example, uh, detect anomalies. So if you have outliers, for example, um, that don't seem to meet the normal sort of scope and scale of the data that you collect, and you can use AI to flag that up and report that to a data steward, for example. And they can also, in a very similar way, then um, help with data standardization. So in conclusion, um, the one thing I always show this slide, and apologies if you've heard me before, because you've probably seen me present this before, so, you know, how do you fix data quality and get it fixed? The problem at the moment is that most organizations continue to treat these things reactively. They wait till the fires break out. They send the fire brigade in and they put the fires out. That is a bad and inefficient way of doing data quality. Much better way is some of the ways that we described, that you actually proactively look to prevent the fires from breaking out in the first place. So if somebody says to you, yeah, data quality is all well and good, but we're really busy doing lots of other things. Then basically you say to them, well, you're doing data quality management now, but you're just doing it really badly. So why don't you do it more efficiently and more proactively? Okay, and that's my bit done. Donna, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, you know, I think in that, that kind of topped and tailed that last slide with some of the slides we showed with the facts and figures behind what, what Nigel just said, that, you know, all, all CDOs, all companies are looking at data quality. Some are fighting it after the fact, and some are proactively looking at those, and those that, that do are really getting some business benefit from it, and that's why we're all here. We're not just doing it for the fun of it, right? So building that solid data quality foundation does need this holistic approach, you know, and I think Nigel did a great job of explaining that it's a bit people, it's a bit process, a bit tech to really get that right. And, you know, hopefully that, you know, ADE methodology is kind of just kind of a helpful way to, to frame it. You might be doing all these things, but I think the, the way of, you know, we find it helpful in our, our practice of, you know, every time we look at it, are we doing the right steps? And then is it cyclical? How do we always kind of use the phrase rinse and repeat, right? We fix on one area. And as, as Nigel mentioned, it's going to build off itself. So it may just like a fire, the more you get out, uh, the easier it is to contain the rest, right? So um, it does improve over time and measuring that in terms of the dashboards also gives that sense of, you know, Nig Nigel mentioned as well, that it's a communication process and showing the wins is also good along the way. I mean, we kind of just had a fun hour, uh, you know, kind of collectively venting as a data management community about the, some of the problems, but that doesn't go over very well long term, right? You have to start showing those benefits and they will happen. And that's where we're really picking on that high quality data first can be really effective. So um, again, if if you've missed any of the past, please please catch these. We hope you can join us. It will, will just be little old me next month um, on metadata, which is a, a close cousin and friend of data quality, as well as some of the rest uh, throughout the year. Um, we do this for a living. Um, hopefully that was clear. If you need help with data quality or anything, don't hesitate to contact either of us. Um, we'd be happy to help. And with that, I'm going to pass it back um, to Q&A, so over to you. 
so many questions and so many wonderful questions uh, that uh, so thanks everybody for for submitting some some excellent questions here and and Donna and, and Nigel somebody posed a question uh, and I've had several debates with people about this particular mm -hmm. topic so I'm fascinated to hear your take on this does data observability fall under data quality uh, strategy or is it considered a separate capability I'll, I'll take that first and then pass it to you, Nigel. I'd love your perspective as well. Um, I, I would say, well, just to, we love our definitions. I think data observability is more holistic. I mean, that's really looking at not only your data quality, but your your data lineage, your, your flows of data, the data structures. Um, and so I think kind of when I, I mentioned some of the showing our data strategy framework and the Damon DM you know, these things are all interrelated. So I, you know, you could overstate it and really data quality is part of everything and you need everything to solve data quality. Um, but I think, you know, those actions of data observability are absolutely needed to really get to that root cause analysis. You don't know how data is flowing. You don't know how it's structured. You can't observe it as it, as it you know, is designed, moved and used. It's really going to be hard to maintain data quality. And so those companies that do have a good foundation with that, fixing the problem is a whole lot easier. Or maybe those problems don't have this crazy idea. Someone designed it ahead of time um, and they're able to do that. But Nigel, I'd be really interested in your take. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. For me, I mean, the, the you know, the overlap, if you like, between uh, agree with Donna, what she said, it's it, it's data observability is really a very useful approach for doing the evaluate phase that we talked about. So, you know, you make your data quality improvements, you know, using something like A2E, and then you can actually make sure then that your data observability processes are then doing that monitoring for you. So I think, again, you know, the, the two things are synergistic. The important thing is whoever developing your data observability solutions and your data quality solutions should be joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, for organizations without a formal a data quality management framework and with limited budget for tools, what steps can they take to start improving data quality? Is it more effective to address data quality by focusing on individual departments or by selecting a key data set that spans multiple departments? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you first again this time and pass it over to Nigel. I mean, you don't need only tools to do it right. And I think what the, the questioner mentioned is, is great, right? Hopefully you have some sort of data governance group that can help prioritize. As Nigel mentioned, if you don't just get some people together initially who care, you know, find some of those wins, do the root cause analysis. And even to do some of that analysis, uh, I think Nigel mentioned it too, you can do some of that profiling in SQL or in a spreadsheet, right? Um, storytelling, I, I was kind of scanning through some of the other questions that often helps too. I mean, sometimes finding some of those early quality it, uh, issues and, and you, you show the impact of, you know, we did a really successful one of just showing the impact of email addresses that weren't completed, weren't corrected, all the impacts across customer support, you know, shipping and delivery, you know, sales, all of that to really get the buy-in of doing it right. And then the rest of the cases were were easier to solve because you had that kind of, people got it and you could kind of do that rinse and repeat. So I, I would choose your early ones carefully, something that both, yes, you can quantify, you think you can fix. Um, and, and you can, it's a good storytelling of, remember when we fixed that email, we had one, I'll, I'll shut up soon. It was a nonprofit and they went and they cleaned up some addresses and they were literally able to see what these addresses we cleaned the next year, they had gotten like 200,000 us dollars in donations from those people. Right. And so that was really helpful. It's the first thing they did that now, everything else I did. Remember when we cleaned up addresses, we actually got a quantifiable business. Can't always do that, but somehow picking that first one because it's going to help, you know, get the buy-in if, if you do need tools down the road or, or you know, establish governance or something. But Nigel, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, I mean, when you're in that scenario, you can, you can either approach this from the top down or the bottom up. I worry about if you just pick on a couple of data quality problems that you're aware of and focus on those you can't be sure they are the right problems to put your time and effort into. Personally, I like a combination of the two so that, you know, you almost start from the, you know, when I say the top down, I mean, if you work in the finance department, I'm not suggesting you should look across the whole of your organization, but you should at least look across the whole of the finance department, uh, understand who the stakeholders are. They go through that same process, uh, then work with them to identify maybe two or three key data quality issues that are impacting finance and maybe impacting the consumers of that data down the line somewhere. 
And then, as Donna said, you know, focus your attention on fixing one or two of them. And then there's nothing in data quality that succeeds like success. And in my, in my, I've heard people who say, you know, I've been talking about data quality for two years and nobody's listening to me. Then the first question I will always say, well, what data quality problem have you solved in the last two years? And they always go, well, we haven't got that far yet. That's why they're not convincing people. There is no better way of proving the value of improved data quality than delivering a data quality improvement project, communicating and marketing that and showing people, look, what we did here, we can do that for you too. Excellent. I love that. And I love the example of uh, cleaning up some addresses to, to sell more product. I, I have a very similar story to you, Donna. Um, okay. We... We have a, a one of another one of my favoritest questions of all time in Q and A. Uh, somebody asked the chicken and egg question: Which comes first, data quality or data governance? Yeah, well, I'll pass that one to you first, Nigel. I know this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it is a chicken. It is a chicken and egg because the answer is either of both. So I, <laughs> That's I, I yeah, I've worked in organizations where they have no data governance, but they know they've got data quality problems, and you create these working groups, as I mentioned, uh, of concerned stakeholders and experts and subject matter experts and you put them together and you get them to discuss the problem they look at some of the profiling results and uh, one of the questions as they begin to try and fix the problems one of the questions somebody will always ask quite rightly how are we going to stop this happening again um how are we not going to be doing this repeating this exercise again in a year's time and part of the solution to that oh hang on maybe we ought to make some people accountable for this data make them responsible for it and then from that, data governance can emanate. Most organ, and I'm looking at it from the other angle. Um, the, still, in certainly in the UK, the number one reason why com more companies are looking at data governance as a solution to their data issues is for, to improve the quality of their data. So it can work either way. And again, I use my favorite word of the night is a synergy between the two things. You know, yeah. better data governance will help to drive up data quality. Improving data quality will prove the need for better governance of data. Yeah, my two cents is similar. I would just say, where are you today, right? If you have a really great data governance framework already and people involved, that's they're great folks to help you define what the key priorities are because that's their accountability. If you don't, as Nigel said, data quality is often a very, really great way to convince people of the need for governance. So my answer is similar to Nigel's, but I think it depends where you are and then one can help build the other. All right, we have a couple more minutes. I think we can squeeze in another one more. I think we can <laughs> um and 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 we've got another one of my favorite style of questions here is uh how do you deal with the fact that many it stakeholders focus on getting data and getting it from a to b rather than the quality of that data mm. uh, yeah I'll, I'll i'll take that one first i mean i do think that's where where governance comes in right get it you have to get the the business folks involved and it's the you know it becomes so it, it it's it's tempting to get well i think we've gotten over the sugar high of of big data where you just get more of it and everything will be better and i think a lot of us in the industry said well quantity over quality right so i mean i i still think it's it's governance that gets the business people involved to really look at that data and show the value and curate it but but nigel what do you think yeah, I agree, Donna. I mean, at the end of the day, the only people, in my opinion, who can judge data quality is the business. So maybe many IT stakeholders are getting the data and not worrying about the quality because they don't actually know what the impact of that quality of that data is. So that's where the, the business and IT have to work together on these things and educate each other as to what they jointly need to do in order to make the data fit for purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that too. <laughs> and it's, I've often seen cases where the IT department doesn't have skin in the game. So there's there's a lack of association to data quality there. Yeah, and well, I just add there, Mark, if you, if you Google it, the history of our industry is, is strewn with disasters caused by that very problem that the data is seen and data quality is seen as an IT problem. The business doesn't get involved. And then I, I could talk for the next hour about some of the major disasters that that has caused. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I We're running right close to the clock here. So I, I think that's all we have time for, for today. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Donna and, and Nigel for such a wonderful presentation and Q and A. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.